evening and welcome to Jihad Watch on ABN. I'm Robert Spencer and we continue this week with our interviews with famous and important freedom fighters. And I'm very happy to say that we have with us tonight Walid Shubat, the notorious and renowned ex-terrorist and now Christian freedom fighter against the forces of Jihad and Islamic supremacism. Welcome, Walid. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. And uh, I, I wanted to note, Walid, that actually the topic that I listed for tonight's show is religion and politics. And of course, I don't know if you were told when uh, you were a young man, but I was told when I was a child, never discuss religion and politics. Those were like the two things that were off limits. And this is what my parents told me. And they told me this because they said, if you, you want to have friends and uh, have a wide circle of friends and enjoy social occasions, if you bring up religion and politics, then people will start arguing and they won't be friends anymore. And so that's what's on the line tonight, Waleed. Uh, we're going to talk about religion and politics, everything that is controversial and go against what my mother told me. And I hope that at the end of the hour we will still be friends, but we're going to touch on a number of hot button issues tonight. And I thank you for uh, your, actually you suggested this, and uh, I, I, I thank you for the suggestion. I think it's a great idea, and I'm going to start right away with you yourself. Waleed, of course, uh, you have represented yourself to be a uh, former PLO terrorist, if I understand that correctly, and a convert to Christianity from Islam. And yet CNN, uh, not too long ago, actually I guess a couple years ago, was it Anderson Cooper? They uh, supposedly exposed you. and. Uh, showed that everything about you is a fraud. And I've actually heard that from others, uh, even people on the counter-jihad side. And so uh, w what's your story? What's your answer to that? Well, bring the whole world to challenge me whether I'm a fraud or not. That's fine. I'd love to uh, face the entire globe, answer a simple question. If I was a fraud, how come no one in the world can gain any statements by the Israeli government, police officials, or any government officials that basically state that I was never in prison or I was never a terrorist. You'll never find such statements. It was shocking to me when I was watching television on July 21st, 2011, turn on CNN, and there it was. They said Walid Shubat, you know, his message is the epitome of good versus evil. He has advertised pedigree that makes him an expert Islamic terrorist turn ultra conservative Christian and went on and on. So I said, well, that's me. And then the report says an ex-terrorist Walid Shubat's claim to fame, basically those stories are fraud and untrue. Oh, I was shocked. I said, maybe I wasn't a terrorist. Maybe I was hit with amnesia and CNN is trying to remind me truly <laughs> who I was. And then this, this is what happened. A few days later, I turned the TV on and watched CNN. What did they say? They said they had a breakthrough. A story connected me to uh, one of the world's greatest terrorist in Europe, Andrew Breivik. I, even, I don't even know how to pronounce his name. Uh, Andrew's, uh, Andrews Bering Breivik, yes. Breivik, yeah, Breivik. And this is the man accused of killing dozens of two, uh, in, in two attacks in Norway last Friday, was an admirer of someone you first heard about right here in CNN, the so-called reformed terrorist, and went on to say that I had connections with him. Uh, so they said, what is troubling about this connection in Norway? <coughs> Because not only uh, does Shubat reach out to the would-be terrorist over in Norway. So then I looked at the TV and I said, well, I guess I'm a terrorist after all. <laughs> so, okay, so but wait a minute. Waleed, wait a minute. Hold on now. Just a second. You're saying, okay, they, they connected you to Brevik. I understand that because they connected me to Brevik too. This guy, he, he's, he's a madman. He raved in this manifesto that's 1,500 pages long about every manner of thing. He talks about allying with Hamas. You never hear about that in the news, but he did talk about it. He talks about allying with Hamas and uh, Islamic jihadis, Al-Qaeda, in Europe to bring down the European order. And uh, this is supposed to be somebody who read you and read me and was inspired by us. It's ridiculous. Right. He quoted us. He quoted Barack Obama. He quoted Thomas Jefferson. He quoted John Locke. Uh, you know, we don't have any connection to him, but the point that I'm trying to make actually is aside from the obvious fact that there's no way that any reasonable person could connect us to what Breivik did. Breivik, he was a terrorist 
but he was not an Islamic Jihad terrorist, even though he wanted to ally with them. And he was not invoking the Quran to justify his violence. And what you were claiming is, as far as I understand it, that you were an Islamic Jihad terrorist. So it's a different kind of thing. So what do you say to those who say that you uh, actually had no connection to terrorism, that the Israelis, yes, they, they've never said and they couldn't say that you were uh, not arrested or were not involved with the PLO. But also there was something else, and this is uh, the, what I'm getting at. Didn't you have a familial connection with somebody who is high up in uh, the Islamic Jihad movement? Several. Several. Uh, in fact, uh, you look at uh, some of my relatives. You have Kamal Yunus, uh, the brother of Jawad Yunus, who began to criticize me. In fact, Kamal Yunus stated that I was in prison, stated that I got involved with the PLO in prison. So my own family confessed that I was a terrorist. The problem is, is that CNN went to a different family member and made up the story without even examining what was been said by some of my family members who admitted I was in prison. The whole argument of CNN that I was in prison. Uh, Jawad Yunus, the brother of Kamal Yunus, is in Jordan. He is part of the Muslim Brotherhood. He is planning to oust the kingdom of J the Jordanian kingdom. In fact, he is involved uh, in uh, being a defense attorney for Abu Zubayda, one of the top of Al Qaeda. Uh, he was, in fact, I described him to a T. His brother couldn't even deny it, that I knew the family, I knew everything. Uh, my cousin Raid Shu'ibat was a terrorist who uh, was killed on his way to Ben Yehuda Street. My famed cousin, Arin Shu'ibat, which no one can deny is my cousin, and no one can deny that she had a similar story to mine. She was supposed to detonate a bomb as a suicide bomber. That's, well, my time there was no suicide bombers. And she, her friend, her colleague, her partner in crime, detonated, killed a few Israelis in Operation Rishon Litzion. No one can deny I'm related to Arin Shu'ibat. Uh, my cousin Ibrahim Awadallah Shu'ibat, the brother of Raid Shu'ibat, by the way, I don't think you even know that he is, uh, he, I have documentation and photos with him, with Faisal Abdul Rauf. Faisal oh, Abdul yeah. oh my goodness. Yes. Faisal Abdul Rauf, for those of you who may not know the name, uh, is the celebrated Imam of the uh, Ground Zero Mosque, which did not ever get built, and we hope it never will get built. But uh, he was the foremost front, front man for the effort to build a 16-story triumphal victory mosque at Ground Zero. And Faisal Abdul Rauf is somebody who's extraordinarily well-connected. He gets sent out by the State Department to Muslim countries as a goodwill ambassador for the United States. And yet he has ties to the Muslim Brotherhood. He has uh, praised, uh, he, he has blamed the United States for 9-11. He, he, he is clearly not the moderate that he claims to be, not at all. And so you're give, just giving us more evidence of that now, Waleed. Right. My cousin Ibrahim Awadallah Shu'ibat, the brother of the terrorist Raid Shu'ibat, he is the Grand Mufti of Ramallah in Ramallah. So no one can deny he's the, a Mufti. And he collaborated with Faisal Abdul Rauf to do da'wah in America, South America, and all of this stuff. In fact, you know, it behooves me. Why am I the first one in this country? In fact, I consider myself a pioneer, not that I wanted to, in discovering the Arabic language to thwart what they're saying in the English language. You had Faisal Abdul Rauf when he was interviewed in Fox News by Sean Hannity, who basically tried to ask him the questions, do you support terrorism, do you support Al-Qaeda, these kind of things, and he pleaded the fifth. I was the one who went and got oodles of information, interviews he did in universities in Egypt, and radios in Egypt, in Jordan, wrote an article for Al Ghad newspaper in which he elevated Hezbollah and Hamas terrorist organizations, showing clearly that this is the way to advance Islam. So, uh, you know, they don't need, Americans don't need to basically try to extract information in the English. We have it in the Arabic language translated to English. <coughs> in fact, some people try to say, you know, we can't trust Wally's translations. One time they sent my translations to the university, the American University in Lebanon, in which scholars, Muslim scholars, looked at the translation and condemned me, but, couldn't, but could not condemn the translation. Mm -hmm. So I dare anyone to refute any of my translation work. It's verbatim of what these people are saying. And this is why after years of these efforts, 
I decided to write my book, The Case for Islamophobia. Yes, other... I yes. love that title. I, I've been called the nation's leading Islamophobe, and so I take it as kind of a, uh, a, a handbook or a tribute <laughs> to my own work, but I don't mean to be uh, self-centered about it. Islamophobia is a much bigger thing. But look, Walid here again, uh, wa Islamophobia is a made-up concept that is designed to intimidate people into thinking there's something wrong with, ji with resisting jihad and Islamic supremacism. And so how can you write a book called The Case for Islamophobia? Aren't you trying to make a case in that sense for the Muslim Brotherhood and Islamic supremacism? No, it's actually reverse psychology. Uh, Muslims who complain about Islamophobia ignore the real issues. What we have is Judeophobia, Christophobia, Ameriphobia. In fact, philosopher Pierre Ben suggests that perhaps who fear the rise of Islamophobia foster an environment that is not intellectually or morally, morally healthy uh, to the point that what he calls Islamophobia phobia. Let me explain. If the United States, if there are elements in the United States from the conservative says to Turkey, you know, wait a minute, guys over there, you need to confess the Armenian genocide. You have Hillary Clinton objecting. No, 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 we don't want to offend the Turks. We don't want to offend the Muslims. This will rock the boat. This will basically cause a rift between us and the Turks, and we don't want to uh, upset the delicate peace negotiations here and there. So let's not talk about those issues. So who is the one with the phobia? The ones with the phobia is the liberal left who's afraid to address the issues. They're the Islamophobes who are accusing everybody else of being Islamophobic. Absolutely, absolutely. And there is Islamophobophobia. I've written about that before, that there are people who are so desperately afraid of being called Islamophobes that, uh, or racists and bigots and all the rest of the nonsense that the left throws at anybody who stands up and speaks out about jihad and Islamic supremacism, that they will uh, say, put up with anything and, and, and uh, remain silent in the face of the escalating persecution of Christians in the Muslim world and at the oppression of women and all the rest of it, because the, the alternative for them is to be tarred with these charges, and that they cannot endure. Correct. Uh, in fact, you know, uh, how could anybody argue that fear of sharia or fear of Islamization through jihad is a phobia? Phobia means fear. You, you know, you're being fearless if you address the issue. I went to a, an, uh, a, a debate one time. I, f I was flown all the way to Barbados to uh, uh, debate a Muslim imam there. And he gave one hour lecture on why Islam is a peaceful religion. I was flown all the way to Barbados to spend two seconds, really, few seconds there. I got up to the pulpit and I said, you know, this man just gave a lecture how peaceful Islam is. Uh, I have but one question to ask the imam. I learned from Jesus how to ask questions. The question was the following. I says, Sharia law says to amputate the hands of thieves. Sharia law, even in the civil code, will not allow a mosque to be sold to convert to a church if the imam is not making his payments to the bank, that is. Uh, it, Sharia law says a woman inherits half the, the amount of monies from her family as of her male counterpart. Sharia law, Sharia law, Sharia law. I give all the things. I said, are you willing right here and right now to condemn Sharia law, these laws that are in Sharia. It's a yes or a no answer. He said, of course not. I says, well, then uh, what you said for the last hour is a lie. I guess I'm done with my speech. Thank you for all coming. <laughs> it was done. I mean, what's there to talk about? You know, if this guy cannot condemn Sharia, he's not a peaceful Muslim, is he? No, not at all. And so the, the, the thing that you exposed, though, is the contradiction between the reality of Islam and the way that Islam is packaged and presented to the West. And Correct. the yes. non-Muslims, they don't know. You know you, you know what's in Sharia law. I know what's in Sharia law. But most people who don't uh, do this, they have no idea what is in Sharia. And so they hear this uh, imam saying I everything is peaceful and tolerant. And they think, well, then everything must be peaceful and tolerant and it's all fine. And, you know, I can tell you a story of the same kind, actually, in the 90s, before I was doing this work publicly. I went to an interfaith meeting, and there were imams from all over the world. There were imams from uh, Syria, from Iraq, from Egypt, 
from Malaysia and Indonesia, uh, Nigeria, and they all got up one after the other and they said that Islam is peaceful and tolerant and we love the non-Muslims and uh, we respect and revere uh, Christianity because this was a, a, a Christian Muslim meeting and there were Christian priests and bishops there as well. And uh, I hadn't published any books at that time and nobody knew that I was doing this work. And so I stood up and I said, you know, uh, I hear these things in the media. You know how the media is. And I hear these things that are critical of Islam. And I heard that the Quran says, Muhammad is the apostle of Allah, and those who follow him are merciful to one another, but ruthless to the unbelievers. Now, that seems to contradict what you're saying about uh, how Islam respects and reveres people of other religions. So can you explain how that could go together? And they said, oh, that's not in the Quran. And I said, well, actually, I remember the article, and it said that it was in chapter 48, verse 29. Can you check? And so they took the Quran and, and flipped through and found that it was. And he says, oh, it is in there. And then he, he had some uh, uh, dissembling statement to make, but the uh, whole talk had been exploded, that they were peaceful and tolerant, and yet these things were going against the Quran. And so the problem is that most Americans don't have any idea what's in the Quran and can't ask questions like that, and so they just follow the propaganda. Correct. In fact, uh, I asked, uh, what was the guy's name in C the CIA? Uh, ex-CIA, he's a good guy, and he talked about peaceful Islam. I says, name me one peaceful Muslim scholar that you know, you know. And he gave a reference to, uh, what's his name, Hisham Qabbani. Hisham Qabbani is Sufi. Well, yeah. so is Faisal yeah. Abdul Rauf Sufi, by the way. Yeah, sure he is. I says, did you read the writings of Hisham Qabbani? He says, when the Mahdi appears, Christianity will cease to exist. I said, how is that peaceful? <laughs> In fact, the, the whole myth in America, you know, America has a lot of myth. That's the problem with America. They live in myth. And it is time to bust this myth about all sects of Islam. You know, they're trying to find something that they think is, uh, you know, uh, hopeful. They look at ijtihad. They look at all kinds of things, you know. Uh, yeah, the Sufis. The Sufis are a prime example. I mean, you know, you're mentioning Kabani and Ra'uf. And uh, people always say to me that, uh, oh, you know, well, what you're talking about, you're, you're, you're not giving uh, enough attention to the Muslims who are peaceful, like the Sufis, who spiritualize all those violent passages in the Quran. And they don't know that uh, Hassan al-Banna, the founder of the Muslim Brotherhood, was very enamored of the Sufis and prescribed Sufi spiritual exercises for the early brothers. And that the Sufis in Chechnya have been waging violent jihad against the Russians for a couple of hundred years. And not only that, but Al-Ghazali, the founding figure of Sufism, spoke very forthrightly about the necessity for Muslims to take up arms and wage war against unbelievers and subjugate them. Yes, you're absolutely right. Al-Ghazali, you know, he's the paramount of uh, the golden age and this kind of thing. You know, he says catapult them, kill them, all these things. Mm -hmm. This is the issue that the West doesn't understand, is that in Islam, there is an alkaline to basically suppress the acid reality, if you will. If Omar yeah. ibn Khattab has declarations about don't do this and don't do that and don't burn trees, don't cut trees, and don't, they, they will give you those quotes. But uh, very few will look at the quotes of the acid reality. And so the, pl the game is the good cop, bad cop. The good cop is playing in the Western English language, and the bad cop is saying everything in the Arabic language. So I, what I did in uh, the case of Islamophobia was to bring the good cop and the bad cop from the Arabic sources and to begin to show what they say in the English, the same people, versus what they say in the Arabic. You know, look at Taha Jabr al-Alawani. He runs the military apparatus of uh, raising imams in the military, G-I-S-S. -S, I forgot how it's called. G-I-S-S. Uh, uh, G-I-S-S, -S, yes. And, uh, you know, he, there he writes articles that are so anti, virulently anti-Semitic. I was the first to translate them. You know, talking about the golden calf and how the Jews worship the golden calf and so on and so forth. The stuff comes out of the uh, epitome of hell. You know, it's akin to what we've seen in Nazi Germany. Yet he still serves in the military, being paid by taxpayers to uh, recruit jihadist imams. Uh, like, you know, you have Nadal Malik Hassan. I mean, look at the, mm -hmm. you know, the whole thing with Islamophobia. You had uh, Nadal Malik Hassan kill 14 Americans. You had Private Abdo after him who wanted to commit the same atrocities, he condemned Islamophobia. 
That's yeah, right. he was a terrorist. Yeah, so, Nasser Abdo was a, a, a private in the U.S. Army who uh, had plotted to, who actually got out of the army. I'm just giving the background, Waleed, for those who might not know the story, that uh, he, he got out of the army as a conscientious objector because he didn't want to fight against his fellow Muslims in Afghanistan. And he said he was going to devote the uh, rest of his life, I um, mean, of course, he was quite a young man, but he said he was going to devote the, uh, the, the, his efforts in the future to being a uh, exponent of, of peaceful Islam and to fight against Islamophobia, to show people that not all Muslims were terrorists and so on. And then he started plotting to go in and commit a second massacre of American troops at Fort Hood in imitation of Major Hassan. Correct. In fact, I was condemned by CNN because I spoke at the Dakotas, you know, North Dakota, South Dakota, you know, I don't remember. They, they said there's, there's no Muslims in those areas. Why is Walid speaking there? There's very few Muslims there. But so were very few Muslims living by the Fort Hood area. Yeah. Uh, so the argument to say that, you know, in other words, if, are they saying if there's many Muslims, there's terrorism? Is that what CNN is saying? It's exactly what they're saying. Yeah. There's not many Muslims in the Dakotas. Why should we fear terrorism? In other words, where there are many Muslims abound, there's high terrorism. Well, that's true, but that doesn't negate the case in which we've seen in Texas uh, a terrorist attack by Nadal Malik Hassan, where there's very few Muslims live there. Yeah, absolutely. And so uh, it's sort of funny how CNN betrays that it actually agrees with the things that we're saying and that it knows that there is no distinction within the Muslim community between jihad terrorists and peaceful Muslims in the sense that the, 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 the peaceful Muslims in the United States have never said that you can't come into this mosque if you agree with Osama bin Laden. You can't come into this mosque if you believe that Muslims must wage war against unbelievers. They have never made any kind of declaration like that. And so there is no screening process. There is no filter. There is no one who is standing at the gate and saying, you cannot come in if you are a terrorist or a terrorist sympathizer. And so this makes it uh, very difficult for the, uh, uh, the media because they want to repeat these myths and believe these myths, but reality keeps contradicting them. And then the, your incident in the Dakotas, it shows that they really do know what's up, but their politically correct sensibilities don't allow them to say it forthrightly. Right, but you know, my focus lately has been in why, you know, Islam, me and you address Islam extensively, and my question is, you know, uh, Islam is a symptom, uh, Brother Robert. It's a symptom of a decaying society. It cannot basically enter into a healthy society. The case in Europe uh, is very clear. You have shell churches that are shells. You have abandonment of Christian ethics. You have liberalism abound. So I think the moral decay is the reason. Whenever, wherever there's moral decay in Christendom, there is Islamdom trying to punish it and take over it. And that's an issue that I think that is very rarely addressed in the evangelical or Christian circles in America. Today we have Chrislam. You know, Chrislam is becoming a household name, a common word signed by some of the major evangelical teachers you know you had the you know the uh, what is what is his name uh, uh, Rick Warren America's pastor can yeah. you imagine America's pastor sawing a common word the common word between us and you comes from the Quran as you know yeah uh, uh, you know it, it, it come let us have a common word between us and you that we only worship Allah alone no other in other words it's trying to defy the Trinity there and then you'd have record and say we worship the same God being signatory to this kind of thing. And dare you speak and address those kind of errors because these are famous pastors. And I guess fame comes before truth. Uh, and you have a decaying culture in America that says, you know, uh, works doesn't mean anything. Uh, uh, rewriting really scripture in a way that is very, very, uh, uh, very troubling to me. Uh, we have heretics running churches uh, all over in America, and heresy has steeped into the church. In fact, we can't even address the word heresy anymore, because today in the church, heresy is renamed 
legalism, uh, works, that kind of thing. Well, everybody does works. The liberal does works as well as the Christian who doesn't believe in works does works. Look at someone like Andrew Farley who believes in this kind of garbage. He is a supposedly an evangelical Christian, yet he supports environmentalism. He supports universalism. His wife, uh, Catherine Hayhoe, was ousted by Newt Gingrich for her extreme ideology on environmentalism. Yet those people go around the church circles, sheep, uh, wolves in sheep's clothing, and no one wants to point to them as heretics. Yet they will point to the Catholic, or they will point to this and that, and they will point to all kinds of things as problems in the church, yet not recognizing that the problems is within them. Yeah, oh, absolutely. And uh, this is a, a pandemic problem. I mean, I can tell you as a Catholic that, uh, as you may know, I was supposed to speak at a conference recently, a, a Catholic conference, and the uh, bishop of the local area, Bishop Robert McManus of Worcester, Massachusetts, uh, forbade me to speak because he said it would harm the dialogue that they're having with Muslims if I spoke about the persecution of Christians. And so uh, there you go, you know. What's the dialogue for if you uh, can't talk about the things that are uh, causing the difficulties? Uh, in any case, we are now at the halfway point, Walid, and so we're going to take a short break. This is ABN's Jihad Watch program. I'm Robert Spencer, and our guest today is Walid Shoebat. We will be back after these important messages with more on ABN. Welcome back to ABN's Jihad Watch program. I'm Robert Spencer, and we're here tonight with Walid Shoibat, the no noted and notorious, in some circles, ex-terrorist who is now a uh, Christian and a spokesman for freedom 
against the grim and bloody reality of Islamic jihad that he left behind. Uh, Walid, you were talking before the break about how Islam would never have been able to make any kind of advance in the West if it were not our, for our own weakness, and uh, that the weakness is in the churches to a tremendous degree, that we are uh, caught up with minutiae, with uh, disagreements among ourselves, with side issues, and not facing a problem of immense proportions. And in fact, like uh, Rick Warren, whom you mentioned, even aiding and abetting the enemies of uh, Christianity and the enemies of all the churches in their supremacist agenda. And uh, I wonder if you could explain a little bit about why you think this is happening. What do you think some is going on in the mind of somebody like well, Rick Warren? Well, nothing is new under the sun, Brother Robert. Uh, in fact, you know, you're Catholic. I'm Christian. Uh, I'm a Christian, and, too. <laughs> uh, and, and if you look at the history, uh, I, this has been a problem that I have with many in the evangelical circles. If you look at the history, the ones who thwarted the spreading of Islamic invasions were the Catholics. Uh, how much did the evangelicals do to thwart the spreading of the Islamist movement. Uh, well, there were any uh, evangelicals in 732 when Charles the Hammer, Charles Martel, beat the, uh, the uh, Muslims at Tours in southern France. Yes, uh, but hold on here. Hold on, Robert. Yeah. There's claims that there were Bible oh, believers on. who were against the Catholic Church. You had the Albigenses. You had these, They came know, later. Yeah, well, many, many years later, sure, but it, nevertheless, they claimed those were evangelical Christians. They were uh, akin to their theme of theology. These didn't do anything to thwart the Islamist movement at all. In fact, the problem historically of Islamism moving into the East, into moving into Asia Minor, was a result of what? Uh, right before the Muslim Seljuk Turks took over the, the, the Christian Asia Minor, what happened? the church of that region was vastly engrossed in a her heretical idea uh, of pacifism and anti-militarism. Mm -hmm. Today, we have lots of anti-militarism. You know, you're, as the moment you talk about fighting, they say, oh, you're mi militaristic. You know, you have to avoid any, any, any form of militaristic talk these days. This fomented, by the way, corruption within uh, the government uh, having Byzantium become weak and open to being yes. conquered. Uh, similarly, also in Egypt, the Arab Muslim conquerors, uh, the, how did they march to Egypt? You have to understand that the Muslims began to argue and say, we worship the same God. Well, wow, that's the same as a common word between us and you with Rick Warren being signatory. The Egyptian yes. Christian at that time said, you know what, let's have peace and maybe we do worship the same God. Uh, and in December, of 641 AD, Egyptians realized their mistakes, but it was too late. They were already yoked and subjugated. So there's nothing new under the sun. This is being repeated now, in which you see Rick Warren says, I love gays, I love homosexuals, I love Muslims, I love, I love, I love. Well, my son made a joke one time, says, okay, well, maybe we should continue on. I love uh, pedoph pedophiles, I love criminals, I love uh, uh, cannibals, I love, uh, you know. Uh, how far do you want to go with this I love thing? They have this I love that lives in a vacuum, and that's the problem. L you know, everybody loves. In fact, everybody hates. Robert, you teach hate, and I teach hate. The Muslims doesn't have to go no further. It is true. We do teach hate. I we hate evil, hate. that's all. We hate evil. We hate slander. We hate violence for no reason. We hate murder for no reason, you know, uh, killing some for no reason. Uh, and they love, let's face it, the ones who hate God love death. Yet you find in the evangelical circles like Andrew Farley and his wife, Heho, Catherine Heho, talking about how the earth uh, is uh, becoming uh, problematic because of Christians not, for, uh, you know, facing up to the fact that environmentalism we need to come to come to grips that population needs to be controlled, uh, that we have too many people on earth. <laughs> Hello, what's happened here? What's the difference between this Christian, so-called Christian, and this leftist mantra? It's no difference whatsoever. They've infiltrated into the church. So, you know, evangelicals need to start thinking 
that they're not immune from the virus that has corrupted the church in the past, it's corrupting them as well. Absolutely, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Uh, the problem is that uh, a lot of people become complacent because they think that they are theologically correct and uh, whether or not they are, they proceed from that assumption to think that their perceptions and judgments about virtually everything else must be valid. Or that if somebody that they admire, like Warren or this other fellow that you're uh, mentioning who I'm not familiar with, Farley, Hurley, uh, Farley uh, that, that they think that if they are right about the issues that they care about or right in their understanding of the Bible as they see it or whatever, then they must be right about uh, in Warren's case about Islam and about uh, going to speak to Muslim Brotherhood linked organizations and so on. It must be okay because Warren says the right things about Christianity. Well, that doesn't follow. Not at all. Correct. Absolutely. So what we have, I mean, people need to ask themselves the question, how are we doing? If that theology, that teaching is correct, well, how are we doing? Are we doing better than before? Are we facing the problems in America? You know, how is it that we have a president in the United States of America? You know, we argue whether he's Muslim, he's not Muslim, or whatever he is. But how, you know, you, you, you plug his name on YouTube and you put the word Bible, and he says Bible teaches slavery. <laughs> yeah, you, you plug his name, Barack Hussein Obama, and the Quran, and he says the Quran says, the Quran says, the Quran says, everything positive about the Quran. But what about his connection to his family in Kenya? You know, people don't look into that. I was the first in the country, by the way, to translate the connections of uh, his relatives, uh, uh, Musa Ismail Obama and his uncle, uh, how they were connected with the Wahhabist in Saudi Arabia, raising funds under the Sara Obama Fund, his grandmother, President Obama's grandmother, raising funds uh, with tons of material I provided from the Arabic language showing that they were interviewed, he was interviewed in Al Jazeera television in Saudi Arabia, calling for funds for what? To send recruits from Africa to go to the most virulent Wahhabist schools in Saudi Arabia, like Umm Al Qura University, which by the way is the center of Wahhabism, and raising all these you know, millions of dollars to recruit Islamic jihadists in the name of President Obama. This should be problematic. How are be. we doing? How are we doing when we look at Michelle Bachman, who raises an issue about the infiltration of uh, Muslim Brotherhood into the government? I spend a month you know, creating information, you know, sorry, uh, finding information from the Arabic language about Huma Abedin's mother, Saleha Abedin. It turns out she wasn't, a mem she wasn't a member of the Muslim Brotherhood. She was a leader in the Muslim Brotherhood. Her father making a manifesto with the government, with the Wahhabist government of Saudi Arabia and how they're going to destroy America. So when Brother Robert, you talk about how the Muslim Brotherhood wants to destroy America, America from within, I am talking about the Saudi infiltration as well with people in the American government. So this is uh, not an issue of guilt by association because when you work for the government, associations do count. Absolutely. And also, you know, it's, uh, it's interesting that there was that uh, article in an Egyptian newspaper in December that I'm sure that you saw that uh, said because of the Muslim Brotherhood infiltrators in the United States government, the United States has turned from the foremost foe of Islam to the foremost enabler of the Muslim Brotherhood agenda and named many of the same people that Michelle Bachman had named as being a sign of Muslim Brotherhood infiltration, and yet when she named them and called for an investigation, she was ridiculed. This just shows the power of the Muslim Brotherhood apparatus in the United States, does it not? Of course it does, but it also shows the cowardice. Now, you have four standing with her, three or four congressmen uh, standing with Michelle Bachman, how many Congress do we have? Uh, 300 to 400. I, I lost we have count. 435. 435. So yes. four stood with Bachman to do a probe, and the rest refused and ridiculed her. What does that tell us about the United States government? It's it very bad, me. and it shows that there's no, there's no opposition, really, because we're talking about the Republicans. Barack Obama is enabling the Muslim Brotherhood all over the world, and the Republicans, instead of standing up and saying, we oppose all this, they, uh, they throw her to the wolves. Divide four by 400, what's the answer? 
what? I don't know, 100. I'm not a math guy, Waleed. I don't know. Four divided by four, <laughs> 400 is 1%. 1%. One percent. One percent. I think so you're right. Yes. I remember that from sixth grade. Yes. Right. 99% of the Congress are cowards. Absolutely. Hello, oh, my yeah. fellow Christians, I have a message for you. I have a message to every Christian who's listening to the show or watching. The cowards will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. There is no cowards in the kingdom. So how could somebody say they're Christian and they kowtow? And this is how you notice a heretic. A heretic is the kind of guy that as soon as the pressure comes, they flee, they recant, they pre-qualify their statements. They're cowards. They're wolves in sheep's clothing. This is the status of this country. This is why in my subtitle, in my book, I say America's last chance because it's the same issue that happened in Asia Minor. It's the same issue that happened in Egypt. History repeats itself. There's nothing new under the sun except the manure that is baking and no one wants to notice it. Absolutely, absolutely. And so what do we do now? What do you think that uh, uh, we have a chance? How do you think that we could possibly prevail when the, uh, the government elites and the media elites are all against us and the churches well, always, are indifferent. You know, I'm a Christian. I always ask the question is what causes, what, what's the reason for Christ to come? In the past, when you had Nazi Germany, the Almighty somehow, you know, had Japan hit the United States at Pearl Harbor. The giant was woken up and then he bombed the heck out of Dresden and, uh, you know, Hiroshima, Nagasaki and stopped evil empires from rising. What's the purpose for Christ to come back well the only the purpose for Christ to come back is that there is not many who are going to be doing the ample the the, the, the needed fight to basically clean this earth uh, so you know I think we're going down the slippery slope I don't think there's a way of turning I don't you know you ask me the question of how can we turn the tide I think many will do great endeavors that's in the Bible you know he will deceive many the saints will be uh, the persecuted so I expect more persecution of the saints and the yes. church will be very quiet about that persecution we just got involved in rescuing uh, a Christian Catholic uh, named Ryan Stanton from uh, Pakistan boy I went to uh, several churches evangelical churches asking for help to help the brothers who are dying in Pakistan only one church out of so many gave us a few hundred dollars to help rescue Christians in Pakistan. Well, Incredible. I guess they're Catholics. Don't serve the Catholic so he can survive, I guess. That's the problem that we have. We talk about unity. We talk about all these things, yet we're so divided. Yes, absolutely. And this, I think, is a big problem, that uh, evangelicals don't see Catholics. I mean, you said it before. You're a Catholic. I'm a Christian. Well, of course, Catholics are Christians as well. And it is uh, unfortunate that evangelicals don't think that that's the case because when they see Catholics being persecuted or when they see Orthodox being persecuted, they don't think of them as their brothers and sisters. They think of them as uh, part of some alien sect. And Catholics actually uh, tend to act the same way and not even to care when their fellow Catholics are being persecuted. So the problem is very deep. It's uh, it's. It's, it's not at all like in uh, Islam, for example, where it, they're constantly told that they're members of one ummah and have to take care of one another. Although they fight, but of course, amongst themselves a great deal as well. May I, may, I remind, may I remind the viewers, listeners who's watching this, if I study my Bible, my friend, and I look where Christ comes to earth, you know, I went to many evangelical churches in this country where they sing the song, Behold, He Comes Riding on the Clouds. And I asked the question, I says, when He comes riding on the clouds, where is He going? That is Jesus Christ. Where is He going? No one knows. They say He's going to Jerusalem. He's going here. He's going there. I says, well, that comes from a verse in the book of Isaiah in chapter 19. Behold, the Lord comes riding on a swift cloud and is coming into Egypt. The idols of Egypt will totter before him. Wow, I can't wait, Brother Robert, till the Messiah comes. He comes to Egypt to fight. When was the last time you've heard any preacher say, or, or Sunday school teacher says, you know, well, today we'll be discussing how the Lord Jesus Christ is coming to fight the Muslims in Egypt. <laughs> Hello? Yet, yet, what does it also say? It also says there will be a civil war in Egypt. 
In fact, Brother Robert, I said it on the radio and TV. I said there will be a civil war in Egypt. There'll be a civil war in Egypt. No one was listening to me. Where brother will kill brother, neighbor against neighbor, city against city. You have Port Said fighting Cairo <laughs> over a soccer game. And I said, well, when they cry out to the Lord, the believers in Egypt, there are believers in Egypt. Who are they? The they cry to the Lord. They cry to the Lord to send them a savior. And the Lord will send them a savior and a mighty one. Who is okay. the savior? But wait a minute. Wait just a minute, Waleed. I understand about civil war in Egypt. That's manifest. And that's happening now. But when you say that uh, the Bible says that Jesus is going to come and fight against the Muslims in Egypt, that, uh, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm just a poor Catholic. You've got to per, per, pardon me here. But that sounds to me like the horrible eschatology of the Shiites and the Sunnis as well, as a matter of fact, uh, but especially the Shiites, where they say that Jesus, the Muslim prophet, is going to come back and wage war against the Christians and kill them all. And I don't believe there's anything like that in, uh, in, in Christian theology. Absol absolutely not. In fact, if you look at the Islamic theology, they say that their Mahdi is the one who rides the white horse in the book of Revelation. From Christian theology, that's the Antichrist. So the Mahdi, and this is the problem of having teaching in the evangelical circles about this Mahdi figure in Islam. You know, the Muslims notice him when he creates a seven-year peace in the world. Well, Daniel talks about a seven-year peace treaty, which the Antichrist does. Mm -hmm. uh, you look at the Christ. Christ fights every place he fights. He's fighting Muslims. What about Habakkuk chapter 3? He comes to fight Midian. He comes to fight Kushan, Sudan, Somalia, Midian, Arabia. When was the last time you studied, we studied that? Uh, the Messiah in Isaiah chapter 10, uh, he comes uh, to fight in Lebanon. Uh, he also comes to fight Gog and Magog. In fact, the Messiah in Zechariah chapter 9, he goes with the whirlwinds from the south to fight Ionia, Greece. Well, what is Greece? Ionia. Ionia is in Turkey. He goes to fight the Turks, the rise of the Turks. In fact, in Ezekiel 28, on the day of the Lord, who is the Lord fighting? He fights Lydia, Turkey. He fights Libya, North Africa, the Moors. You know, he fights Kush, Sudan, Somalia. He's coming for a fight. It, Christianity is not this unmilitaristic unmilita view. There is a fight in the Bible. Well, this, uh, you know, these, these are things that I haven't studied, I'm not familiar with. But like I say, it does sound to me like you're saying that the uh, second coming of Christ is going to be like the coming of the Mahdi and uh, of Christ the Muslim prophet in Islam. And he's going to wage war against the unbelievers. Well, there is similarities. The Muslim, remember, the Muslims take is Christian eschatology and attribute what is evil in it to their Mahdi. And they attribute what is good in it to them. They I reverse didn't. things. Like, for example, when the Muslims teach the day of judgment shall not come to pass until Islam, the tribes of Islam, defeat the Jews in Jerusalem and the stones and the trees will cry. You know the verses very oh, well in, yeah. in the Hadith. You know, yet this comes from Zechariah. In Zechariah chapters 12 and 14, God will make Jerusalem a trembling stone to all what? To all surrounding nations. And what happens? Then the Lord, he will stand on the Mount of Olives. The Lord will go forth and what? Fight. The Lord fights. Was, well, God is very militaristic. In that day as he fights, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. Can anybody tell me from a Christian circle, whether Catholic, evangelical, or any circle you want, that his feet, God's feet, is not the Messiah, Jesus Christ? Well, I think that you got a very good point. I don't know what form this fighting is going to take. I think that uh, one key difference that we can probably agree on is that in Islamic eschatology, the, uh, it, you know, as Muhammad said, the end times will not come until Muslims kill Jews and the Jews hide behind trees and the trees cry out and say, oh, Muslim, there's a Jew hiding behind me, come kill him. And so the end times are triggered by Muslims killing Jews. And this is a genocidal imperative that is embedded within Islam. Whereas in Christianity, all the passages that you're quoting, if uh, this understanding of them is indeed accurate, you're talking about something that's an eschatological judgment and is not initiated by human beings or carried out by human beings, and so is not something that is some sort of a call to, uh, to, to kill or to make war on the part of the uh, Christian population. 
correct. It's not a war that we're saying now go up and fight because that's something that Christ initiates when he comes. And I believe the believers will be with him because if you look at Zechariah 14, 14, it says, and all the saints with you, with the Messiah. So they're with him fighting. So it, in fact, I can give an hour lecture just on this battle that happens. But the question I was asked is why kill the Jews? What's the purpose of killing the Jews? You mean is for the not, Muslims, not the Christians? Yes, the Jew killing the Jews, the Muslims killing the Jews. What's the purpose of that? The purpose is very clear. Uh, we both agree that the Messiah, would, before he departed the earth, he said about Jerusalem that I will not come. I'm not going to show up until you cry, blessed be he who comes in the name of the Lord. So Israel, in the end, will basically see the Messiah. That will not happen until that is initiated. So if the Jews aren't on earth, they're all destroyed, they break the prophecy, if you will, about Christ's coming. Evil, you know, Lucifer wants to destroy and thwart Jesus' basically mission to basically to do what? In fact, I asked the question from so many evangelicals and Catholics and everybody else. I say, you know, what is the purpose of Christ's coming? What is the purpose of his first coming? Most of them say, well, to save humanity. While that is true, that is one of the missions of Christ's coming. Okay, Christ, what else? Christ, it's very clear in the book of John. You know, he came to do what? To destroy the works of the devil. Yes. To destroy the works of the devil. So how can we as believers destroy the works of the devil if we don't believe in any works? It doesn't make any sense. Everyone believes in works. If Andrew Farley believes in works, even though he espouses that works aren't important at all. Yet, what is this whole works with environmentalism? Hello, you know, everybody does works. Jimmy Carter does works. You know, he wants to split the, the, the Israel into a Palestinian and a Jewish state. That's not works. Of course it's works. You will know them by their fruits. What is fruit? Is work, is what we do on earth. We're not saved by works. Works emanates as a result of our faith in Christ emanates as a result of our us in obedience of Christ salvation is easy but obedience isn't easy obedience yes. is very difficult as you know yes I do well Walid uh, we are coming down to the final five minutes and so uh, I this has been a wide-ranging discussion but I thought that maybe in the in the in the concluding part uh, you could tell us what you think should be the primary works that Christians and uh, really anybody who is trying to defend against the jihad and Islamic supremacism should focus on. What should we be trying to do? Well, at this point, I believe salvaging is one important point we need to do because when Christ comes, in Matthew 25, it's pretty clear. He judges what? The church. Based on what? Based on their works. Based yes, on what yes. they did. About who? About the suffering. The suffering, we keep forgetting about the suffering. For I was naked and you gave me clothes. I was in prison and you visited me. I was hungry and you fed me. How dare we stand idle while our brethren in Egypt, our brethren in Assyria, uh, Iraq, and our brethren all over the place in Pakistan are suffering and we're doing very little about it. That's one important thing. And the other important thing is that God works through the narrow gate. He doesn't work through the wide gate. He doesn't work through people who are tickled, you know, having their ears tickled. We need to take the battle to the Muslim world. In America, they keep talking about racism, racism, racism. America is a country that talks about racism more than any other country in the world. Yet it exercises the least amount of racism than any other country in the world. What country exercises the most amount of racism in the world? Saudi Arabia. We're not addressing Saudi Arabia. Look at Fox archives, see what Fox is doing about Saudi Arabia. Absolutely very little or nothing. The Wahhabist movement of Saudi Arabia intervening in Syria. We need to help our brothers in Syria, what's going on in Syria. Syria is one piece of the domino that the Muslim Brotherhood wants to take over. And this way, they will take over the entire Middle East. So it's a major issue. We're, we're, we're supporting uh, the greater beast, in this case, Turkey, Syria, Saudi Arabia, against the Iranians. I'm not for the Iranians. The Iranians are, the Iran is an evil empire, you know. Uh, so we need to understand the bigger picture as Christians of what in the reality is going on. And we need to look at our Bibles to see what God has been saying. It's not as God has forgotten to mention to us 
the troubles going on in Egypt and Syria and in Le Libya and in North Africa. It's that we haven't studied our Bibles for a long time to see what God has already been saying for two, three thousand years. Well, I guess uh, the difficulty that a lot of people have is that a lot of these passages that you're mentioning are very gnomic and hard to understand, and people throughout history have had different understandings of them. And so it can be very difficult to say, well, the Bible says X, and therefore we should do Y, because it's not really all that clear that the Bible says X. I'm not saying that the Bible doesn't say anything or that it doesn't speak clearly, but especially when you're coming to passages of prophecy, it's, it's very hard. But one thing that we do know, and I think that you, that you and I can agree on, is that... Uh, we know what's right, and we know what is true, and we know what is good, and we need to defend these things now as they are being directly and fully, f fully attacked. And so if we do not defend them now, then we will certainly lose the freedoms that have enabled the church to flourish in the West and throughout history in uh, lands that were hospitable to it. The conditions for that are rapidly changing, you talked about persecution. The persecution of the Christians in the Islamic world is escalating. And the situation for Christians in the United States is getting more difficult with the Obama administration forcing the church to take certain positions and to fund certain things that it doesn't approve of and so on. It's only going to get worse. And so this, these are hard and trying times. And uh, we need to gird our loins and be uh, ready for a great battle to come. Is there a t time for last comment? Absolutely, yes. Uh, Brother Robert, uh, I disagree with you on the point that the, 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 the verses or the issues in the Bible are difficult to understand. I don't approve it. I have stated 15 years ago about the rise of Turkey and the rise of Neo-Ottomanism and the revival of the Ottoman Empire. I learned that from the Bible. No one can refute that anymore. Was I a genius? No, I simply read the book. It's well, very, very Well, you've got to show simple. me because uh, uh, these are things that I'm not familiar with, and I'm not really uh, uh, close to the idea. But I know that all the way back to Joachim of Fiore in the, I believe it was the 12th century, uh, many, many people uh, have interpreted the Bible and read it in light of current events of their own day. Maybe it applied to all the events. Maybe it, or, or maybe all these people were wrong and it only applied to our time. But it's just a general, uh, 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 a general hesitation, not a uh, rejection outright of the idea that there's something in the Bible that could apply to the present day. Well, maybe if one day I will have four hours of your time, okay. uh, I will go through them and you will see how clear they are. They are speaking of the times that we're living in now very clearly. Okay, uh, it's a date. Uh, but we That's are out of time now. And Waleed, it's been a pleasure. It's been a fascinating discussion. And I appreciate you being on with us. This has been uh, ABN's Jihad Watch program. I'm Robert Spencer. And our guest today has been the great freedom fighter, Waleed Shoibat. Uh, tune in next week for more on ABN's Jihad Watch show. I'm Robert Spencer. And God bless you. God bless.